Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. When it comes to the topic of space, one argument I see a lot, particularly from flat earthers, is claiming that rockets couldn't work in the vacuum of space. I mean, they also claim that you can't have the vacuum of space next to Earth's atmosphere without a physical barrier there to contain it, but that's an entirely separate argument. For this video, I want to focus solely on the claims surrounding the workings of the rockets themselves, of which there seems to be two main claims, at least that I'm aware of. The first is claiming that rocket engines couldn't work in a vacuum because you need oxygen for things to burn, and second is there is no atmosphere in space for the engine thrust to push off of, so therefore rockets couldn't propel themselves forward in space. Both of these are misconceptions which I'm going to aim to break down as simply as possible, although this is actual rocket science. But hey, if I fail in doing it, today's sponsor Brilliant.org has classes on rocket science that you can check out, along with hundreds of other classes across math, science and computing. I'm currently working through some of their classes on calculating probability. What I love about Brilliant is how simplified they make things, with interactive animations to make it much easier to visualize topics, as well as explanations for each question so that even if you get something wrong, you can see why you got it wrong. I'm still using Brilliant on a daily basis, with my daily streak now up to 433 days. See if you'd enjoy Brilliant as much as I am by using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan to take a 30 day free trial as well as receiving 20% off an annual subscription. Now firstly let's tackle the argument of needing oxygen and it's worth clarifying that the components needed are fuel and an oxidizer. Now, an oxidizer is something that will accept electrons. So when you mix it with fuel, the fuel gives up electrons to the oxidizer, and then this allows the fuel to ignite. Of course, many common examples that we think of are things like car engines or jet engines, whereby the fuel is oxidizing with the oxygen in the atmosphere. But these are done by design because oxygen is in an abundance around these engines, However, it's possible for fuels to burn when not surrounded by atmosphere. All you need are compounds that contain their own form of an oxidizer. TNT, for example, has its own oxygen molecules, which means that could explode in a vacuum. Or, as Action Lab showed a few years ago, silver fulminate, which is extremely reactive and used in poppets, will ignite in a vacuum. So the right fuels can burn in a vacuum, and when it comes to rockets, there are several different fuels which can be used. The only necessity is that the rockets are carrying their own form of oxidizer. Solid rocket propellants, for example, commonly use ammonium perchlorate as their oxidizer. Liquid fuel rockets, on the other hand, tend to use liquid oxygen. Starship, for example, uses methane for the fuel and oxygen for the oxidizer. Both of these are stored in the rockets as liquid. This is done because liquids are much denser than gas, so they can carry more propellant in the same volume of rocket. However, to get them as a liquid, they need to be very cold, i.e. in the region of around minus 200 degrees Celsius. And because Starship doesn't have any thick insulation like some other kinds of rockets, the extremely low temperatures of the fuel causes frost to form on the outside of the hull. And you can actually see during the fueling stage, there are two distinct frost lines on the booster, one at the bottom and one from about halfway up. The top section is the methane tank and the bottom section is the oxygen tank. So rockets carry their own oxidizer, which allows combustion even when in space. But ultimately the point is sort of moot because even when the rocket is within our atmosphere, it's not burning the air that's surrounding it. In its simplest form, a liquid rocket engine consists of two tanks, one for the fuel and one for the oxidizer, each line having a pump which drives the propellant into a combustion chamber. Here's where the two things mix together and will ignite, and the only escape route for the exhaust is through the narrow section called the throat and then out into the engine nozzle. Well, once the rocket engine ignites, any ambient atmosphere that was within the combustion chamber and the nozzle will be forced out of it. 
So if rockets were burning oxygen from the atmosphere, then immediately after ignition, it would run out of atmosphere to burn and the engine would cut out. So they'd never actually make it off the launch pad, which obviously doesn't happen. But that ties us nicely to the next claim, which is that rockets need atmosphere surrounding them to push off of. And so in space, they couldn't maneuver because there is no atmosphere for the engine thrust to push off which is not how rocket engines produce thrust. For this, it's important to remember Newton's laws of motion. An object's speed or direction will only change when a force is exerted on the object, and that if an object exerts a force onto a second object, the second object will exert an equal and opposite force on the first object. For example, if you had a pool table and a pool ball and you hit it with a cue, if we ignore air resistance and friction from the table, then the ball would travel at a constant speed all the way down the table. If we did it with two balls though, and we hit ball A into ball B, ball A would travel at a constant speed until it hits ball B. The energy from A would then transfer to B, propelling ball B forward at the same speed that A had been traveling at previously and ball A would experience an equal and opposite force from ball B, which would cause ball A to stop. Of course, the perfect demonstration for that is in Newton's cradle, where the energy transfers through multiple objects and only the outer objects move because they don't have any subsequent object to transfer their energy to. Now, let's consider an inflated balloon. Inside are air molecules that will be traveling in all directions and pushing against the walls of the balloon. And before any flat earther tries jumping in at this point and saying that this proves atmosphere needs a container, we're talking about something much smaller than Earth and we're not talking about atmospheric pressure. But anyway, the air inside will be pushing equally in all directions. So even though there will be air pushing against the wall of the balloon on the left, there is a similar amount of force happening on the right side of the balloon, so they'll cancel each other out. Same with the top to bottom and front to back. So all the forces cancel out, meaning there's a zero net force acting on the balloon, and so the balloon doesn't move. But if we were to open the end of the balloon up, the air which would have been pushed against the inside of the balloon in that area now has nothing stopping it, so there's no force pushing the balloon to the right. There is still, however, air pushing on the balloon to the left. This leaves us with a net force pushing the, to the left, and so the balloon moves in that direction. And the same thing happens on the inside of a rocket engine. When the fuel ignites, the exhaust gas pushes outwards in all directions. If the combustion chamber was sealed, then the forces would cancel out and the combustion chamber wouldn't move. But with an opening at the throat, this offers an escape route for the exhaust and a direction with no force then being exerted on the rocket, so the rocket is left with a net force pushing in one direction. Now let's look at the flaws in their ideas that rockets are pushing off the atmosphere. The major problem links back to pool balls. The molecules in the air and the molecules in the rocket's exhaust are like billions of pool balls on a giant table. After ignition, the exhaust gas has to leave the rocket's nozzle in order to collide with the atmosphere. Well, once it hits the atmosphere, the exhaust molecules would then stop and the air molecules would be pushed further away from the rocket. So there would be no force getting transferred back to the rocket to propel it upwards. I mean, they might try and argue that the molecules would bounce off the ground at the launch pad and back up to the rocket, except that would then have them bouncing straight back up into a fresh stream of exhaust gas. So if that were happening, the rocket's exhaust would be seen to be traveling back up into the nozzle, which doesn't happen. In reality, the exhaust may initially try bouncing straight back up, but the subsequent molecules coming down on top of them push them back down again, which ultimately forces the molecules to take the only escape route they can. They can't go further down because the ground's in the way, they can't go back up because the exhaust's pushing them down, so instead they're forced out to the sides. And once the rocket lifts off and begins banking over, the exhaust stream is now angled relative to the ground, so that wouldn't bounce back up towards the rocket anyway. It's no different than how jet engines are able to produce thrust. 
when the exhaust hits the air molecules behind the plane, it will push those molecules away from the plane. There is no force acting on those air molecules that is going to make them go in the same direction as the plane to push it along. And even if there was, by the time that those molecules have started to move back towards the plane, the plane has moved on, meaning the air would need to be travelling faster than the plane in order to catch it up. There are other ways we can see that this doesn't work though. Just look at pop bottle rockets, for example. Those are filled with liquid, and then gas pressure is increased above the liquid, which eventually pushes the liquid out with a lot of force. The liquid molecules coming out are much heavier than the surrounding air molecules, so these would just barge any air molecules out of the way rather than force the water back up towards the bottle. And there are examples where these bottles will thrust upwards before any liquid even reaches the ground. If their claims were correct, at the very minimum, this bottle shouldn't start moving until the liquid has hit the ground and then somehow transferred a force back up through a stream of liquid that's going in the opposite direction and back up to the bottle. But that doesn't happen. In reality, the force of water being pushed out of the bottle is producing an equal and opposite reaction that forces the bottle up in the other direction. And I think that's going to wrap things up for this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.